My colleagues and I would like to describe how to get better estimates of the signal and noise characteristics of the auditory brain response, or the ABR. We are interested in defining the statistics of ABR signals. The basic statistical ideas were laid out in the mid-1980s by Eberling and his colleagues. We are interested in situations when the acoustic stimuli is close to threshold, and thus the ABR signal is weak, and how to define the estimation errors for smaller number of trials. In this talk, we'll describe our statistical approach and summarize the results. As many of you know, the ABR is measured by playing a stimulus, for example, a click to the subject and measuring the responses. The brain's responses are weak and buried in irrelevant noise. By averaging many repetitions, here n, we can form an estimate of the underlying brain response over m time samples. This equation shows the basic model. At each point in time, we want to estimate the signal, which we can do by finding the estimated voltage over time. The voltage that we measure is actually the sum of two quantities, the unknown signal, which is repeated, and the random and thus unknown noise. By adding a number of trials together, we can form an unbiased estimate of the underlying signal. I emphasize the word estimate because we can only know the true signal if we average enough trials. Here's a, derivation, here's a derivation of the power model. I'm skipping it, but those that are interested can pause the video. This is the conclusion. This equation tells us the estimated average power of the measured responses at any one time. It's a function of the number of trials that we average. The good news, as we expect, is that the average power at time t converges to the signal squared. But the accuracy of this estimate varies with the relative signal and noise levels, as well as the number of trials. Note the signal and noise powers add since they are uncorded. This graph shows theoretical and simulated measure power as a function of signal level for a noise level of 4. Again, this is, a, this is at one time t. For high signal levels at the top, the average received ABR power quickly converges to a fixed point. Here the signal level squared of 4. But for lower signal levels, it takes many more trials to reach the asymptote, where the average received power is a good measure of the signal power. This is the regime we care about, low signal levels and fewer trials. This shows the bottom line. The relative signal estimation error is equal to the noise level divided by the signal level, and then divided again by the square root of the number of trials. This is derived by rearranging the equation from two slides ago. The good news, as we expect, is that the signal average converges to the right answer, but only as a square root of the number of trials. When considering the ABR, this is the error bar that one should consider. So, how do we calculate the signal and noise levels each time, given that they are hidden from us? One way is to notice how the average power changes over time, or more precisely, how it changes based on how many trials we average. We know the average power descends with number of trials, and as you can see from the top equation, average power is linear in 1 over n. Thus, as shown in the bottom equation, we can fit the average power as a linear function of x, which we will compute as 1 over n. The slope of this equation will give us the noise power, while the bias will give us the signal power. Thus, if we calculate the average ABR power for different sized windows, we can plug these values into a linear regression and estimate the underlying signal and noise powers. This works even when we don't have enough trials to fully average out the noise. Again, we are doing this regression independently for each time step as the signal power changes over time since the start of the stimulus. How well does it do? This figure shows a signal estimation error for one particular pair of signal and noise levels. When there are a lot of trials, both methods give good, highly accurate answers, as we would hope. When you have slightly fewer trials, in this case around 1,000, the averaging approach is more accurate, perhaps because the linear regression is non-linear and small changes make bigger errors in the estimate. But as we get even fewer trials, the estimation error in the conventional averaging approach grows, and the linear regression gives us a better answers for the hidden signal. <clears throat> Here are the results for real data using human data published by our co-author, Gavin Beidelman. 
The left plot shows the signal estimates, while the right side shows the noise. The conventional approach using averaging in blue, while the linear regression estimates are in red. The two approaches agree when the signal level is high. The regression approach is estimating signal power, so when the square root is taken, we always choose a positive value. But this could be adjusted by using the sign of the averaging approach, but choosing a sign that minimizes the spectral platter, splatter. At the very lowest levels, the regression is inaccurate, and whenever the signal squared estimate is negative, we set the result to zero. We argue that the linear regression approach gives us the more accurate answers. This approach does not take into account impulse noise during the recording, which can be addressed by pre-processing steps. Now we can see the signal noise ratio, SNR, for this real data. This graph is simply the estimated signal levels divided by the noise level from the previous two graphs. At the peak, the noise is six times bigger than the signal. But for much of the ABR, ABR response, the noise is more than 20 times bigger than the signal. The labels on the right convert these estimates into dB. This affects our ability to reliably characterize small changes in the ABR. There's much more we want to do to characterize ABR signals, especially at low levels. We hope you agree that this is a good start.